And there. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Band Books Podcast, episode number, it doesn't matter anymore. 184. 184. And that is Christopher Gillespie. Who is chilling and willing, maxing and relaxing in the last day of November, isn't it? I said we weren't going to make time references, so I just did it. First thing you did. That's the very first thing I did. Yep. Yeah, you know, what are you going to do? So it is the season for preparation, Advent. There, two timestamps. And rather than dive into more Advent stuff on the podcast, we did that last year. We did. Go read John Pless's articles on Advent at fifteen seventeen. They're very good, and he covers, I think, rather well the whole waterfront of Advent and Advent preaching. Oh so yeah, go check out John's articles. I still have his uh, class notes from mm-hmm. uh, lit- liturgy, liturgics, whatever they called it, and uh, <laughs> something like that. Liturgics. Yeah, and uh, he does a wonderful job on bibliography. It's like eighteen pages. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> he does. He yeah, knows well, his stuff. Yeah. I was going to say, most of most of what you listen to John for is the bibliography at the end. Uh-huh. Yep. No, he, do, he does the research. That's so good. So go check that out if you would like to uh, get in deep on Advent and Advent preaching in particular. There's some mm-hmm. really good stuff there. And he goes in depth on one of our spiritual fathers that we've read on the show before, Herman Saze. How many times? A couple. <laughs> a couple, two, three. Lost count? Yeah. But then we thought, you know what? Let's do something different. Let's go back and do some history. Mm-hmm. for Advent and Christmas this year and start off on a happy topic, Christmas in Nazi Germany. <laughs> we talked about, uh, you know, it's, I know it's been a couple of weeks we took last week off, but we mm-hmm. talked about um, the uh, role of the church in Nazi Germany in a couple of mm-hmm. contexts now when we looked at the the writings from 1930. Um, mm-hmm. Zasa was one. Yep. Did we, didn't we do another 1930? Chesterton? Yeah, it was Chesterton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about kind of the role of the of the church in those state related kind of issues right. and how they, they aren't as distinct as one would hope or like. Um because we're well, whole people, right? I mean we Right. In we, the United we, States, that is a hang up that we're still suffering from, which is well, it's an artificial one though, right? I was gonna, yeah, it's a false dichotomy, the separation mm-hmm. of church and state. It exists ide- ideologically, but it doesn't exist in reality. It's like the old um, trope, the three things you don't want to talk about in polite society are religion, sex, and politics. That's literally all anybody wants to talk about. Of course. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I brought up in a Bible study yesterday, it's like, look, the founders of our country, whether they were religiously affiliated or they were more mm-hmm. like a deist variety or whatnot, mm-hmm. um, it's a founding principle as the freedom of mm-hmm. religion for our, for our right. country. I mean, that a lot of the immigrants, initial immigrants, I mean, we even named the states after it, like Maryland right. and Virginia, right? right? right. I mean, these yeah. are these are religiously affiliated states. Right. Um, that distinction, well, the distinction was that the federal government won't establish a religion. Correct. But the states are actually free to, and they still are. Right. And that's, yes. And because, <laughs> Which is awkward, but it's true. Well, we also don't define religions according to traditional um meanings what do you mean so well we think of religion as a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a temple mm. that looks religious i got you versus okay. how ideologies become religion how the state becomes religious or how cult. you live in other words yeah we live in worship we'd put those two right. things together yeah and that's and that's why nazi germany is always the the prime example for people to go to about how the state when it becomes a religion or a cult, this mm-hmm. is what it looks like. Because the iconography, the symbology of the Nazi party and Hitler in particular understood the power of symbol and right. they used that iconography to great effect. And I like, yeah. I like um, uh, the lawyer on uh, YouTube, Viva Fry. You know this guy? Yeah, Viva yeah. Fry, yeah. Yeah, he says politics ruins everything. And the reason is that politics is the realm of power. Correct. There's some authority involved, but sometimes not that much authority. It's more just power plays, right? right. And what's more powerful than mythology or even religious mm-hmm. mythology, right. right? Right. Yeah. Well, as a simple example, then, you know, something I was talking about with somebody the other day is the word mask comes from the French word masquerade. Yeah. And if you look up the definition of masquerade, it tells you everything you need to know about the nature of masks 
and what they represent in literature, in history. Wasn't and, that like a some kind of like pagan ball, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where you dress up and it's a facade, it's a pretense. So you pretend to be someone you're not so that you can do things that you normally wouldn't do. Hmm. Literally to go about under a false pretense or to be a false person, to assume another person, assume a character for oneself, right. to disguise yourself. And mm. so the question becomes then, what are, you, what are you disguising yourself as when you masquerade? Right. And like you said, it was a part of pagan ritual. What are you hiding? Right. right. Your identity, so, ultimately. This, yeah, exactly. And to this day then, that's the purpose of the masquerade. And we, we've talked about this before, that when Protestants sought to get rid of the symbolism of the Roman Catholic Church. Hmm. You know, in my opinion, they threw the baby out with the bathwater and said that all symbol is bad unless it's good to us. Wow. And then in the 20th century in particular, because we didn't, we didn't have a clear-cut understanding of the power of symbol, consumer capitalism targeted us with their marketing right. and their ads, and that became the new religion. And so now we worship products. Hmm. And and we see ourselves in relationship to these corporations then as either consumers of the product or producers of the product. And of course, this is the ultimate conceit of social media is that you're not only producing the content, you're consuming the content. And right. then someone else just sits back and counts money. It's perfect. You make the product for me for free and then consume the product for me. And then I will collect ad revenue from what you're doing with other people. Right. And the AI then yeah. generates or, or at least redirects content Correct. that you only the content mm -hmm. you are most likely to consume so that you Correct. generate more revenue. Right. But it, it's worse than an, uh, what, do they, what they call it, echo chamber. Because mm -hmm. yeah. um, even, in, even in the most intolerant echo chamber, there's always some dissent. <laughs> Correct. Right. right. There's at least one guy in the corner going, um, excuse me, I have a question. Yeah, right. Um, whereas in, in the pure echo chamber of the, of the social media, it's literal. Anybody who mm -hmm. is an outlier gets run out. I mean, they're, they're yeah, you just heretic. never hear them. You never right. see them. Yeah. They get excluded by the AI because it would discourage you from using the platform. Correct. And it's the ultimate masquerade Yeah, because you are literally projecting out into the ether. This is the person that I want you to perceive me to be. This is the character I'm going to play online. Well, it may not, it may even be under a pseudonym. Or a, yeah. a false yeah, identity. a lot of times it is, yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh. So think about all that, and then think about the church. Right. And, the, and especially this time of year, the power symbol in the church, because it is the, the time of year when the pagan and yeah. the overtly pagan and the overtly Christian are mixed together and no one cares. Well, and part of me is like, ah, oh, man, we make a lot out of this, and I wish we kind of mm -hmm. did. If we're going to do it, you know, go all in for uh, yeah. the hol this holiday, why don't we do it for like Easter, right? And right. Uh, it used to be, I think, at least reading like Luther, reading the time of the Reformation, mm -hmm. um, all the uh, iconographic, you know, mythological mm -hmm. kind of stuff around Easter was just as just as significant yeah. as Christmas, if yeah. not even more so. I like our Christmas celebration. It's a little bit German, but it's really more English than anything, I think. Okay, Anglican. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but on on the other hand, it's like okay, if I if I point this out to people, look, you've got all the symbols, and then mm -hmm. then they're going to make all these symbols for all the rest of the church here, and it's right. it's going to end up taking the place of actually the main yeah. point, which is that we're here right. to hear the good news of the gospel, right? And if I point out all of the accoutrement and the unnecessary mm -hmm. aspect of it, then it ends up drawing I'm drawing attention to it, and I'd rather just right. ignore it and just yeah, whatever. It's just which is the other side then of the critique of Protestantism is. Mm. And, and that would be the positive side of my critique, which is they recognized, oh, I think we're actually worshiping the symbols. <laughs> right. We're yeah. venerating the symbols rather than the one that they're pointing to. Yeah. And and again, we don't always know the meaning of them. Yeah. And and it's almost, I've, thought, I've wondered about this, if, if the meaning is, becomes forgotten, then mm -hmm. it's actually mostly harmless at that point. You know, like mm -hmm. people don't think of the tree, the, mm -hmm. the Christmas tree in the way that like two, three, maybe 400 years ago, the Germans might, right? Sure. There, no, we didn't have, we didn't have Christmas trees until, when did they come to the U.S.? There's an article about 18th, it. 1800s, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was Missouri Synod, by the way. It was Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod pastor that introduced You're them welcome. to America. Yeah, I know. Now we right. have two. But, next but that whole, like, uh, the pagan ideology about worship mm -hmm. of trees, I mean, that, that's largely lost on most people, sure. you know, unless they go to, like, Sequoia National Forest or something, mm -hmm. right? 
Well, we also uh, don't light them on fire and dance naked around them either. Well, there's that part. <laughs> I mean, there is the, there is that added wrinkle. Oh, uh, yeah. So, no so origins. I mean, so I mean, somebody in my congregation at one point thought it would be cool to have a white tree on one side and a red tree on the other side. One side with like the mm-hmm. chrismons and the other side with with um, apples. Sure. And I think it's supposed to be law and gospel. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Right, and nobody really knows. They just thought it was yeah. kind of cool, and then they didn't yeah. do it do it for a while because some pastor got upset with them about it. And mm-hmm. then uh, this year it showed up again, and I'm like, meh, whatever. I mean, right. I don't know what it means, but whatever. Right. I mean, I can, I can, I, we could in, insert meaning. We've talked about this in other mm-hmm. contexts. Wasn't it Good Friday with mm-hmm. the whole book yeah. slamming thing? Yeah. yeah. It's like nobody even knows where it came from or what it no. means, but it's it so just important wakes the to kids people. Up and it upsets people, so let's not do that. <laughs> No, it's, but but the, still, the point is, is this stuff can be very very powerful in, in communicating. Yeah. yeah, and uh, maybe maybe in that maybe not so much with words, but like a, a sense of identity, the tribalism. That too, and I yeah, I don't think we recognize that we're visual thinkers. We're not um we're not uh, verbal thinkers. We don't think in words. We're we auditory, but not necessarily verbal. Right. Yeah. And so we think in pictures. Hmm. This is why the earliest languages were drawings that evolved oh, yeah. into what we call modern language cave paintings yes mm-hmm. yeah and pictographs and so forth hieroglyphics mm-hmm. but the point then is in the present tense we don't recognize the power of symbol and then we adopt these symbols uncritically so to counter your point about if it's harmless if you don't know know what mm-hmm. it means. is it i know i was being rhetorical yeah no but I, I think in one sense it is but in the other sense it's not right because we we refuse or we ignore or we're naive to the fact that when we adopt a symbol it defines us. Like you said, it actually starts to give us an identity and a meaning because mm. we look at others and say, well, oh, this person does the same ritual. So I'm a part of this tribe. Mm. Or, mm. I'm a part of this clan because we speak the same language. We act out the same rituals and so forth. And we all do this. This is what gives our life meaning. We're made for community. And yet at the same time, if we don't think critically or soberly about what we are becoming a part of, mm. that's how cults start. Well, doesn't it work the other way? Something might start without meaning and then it takes on meaning and importance. It could be for sure you get together with people and you start talking. Mm -hmm. And it becomes more important than it maybe it was at one point. Yeah, no, I think so. Well, okay. And you either either end up conforming to that that identity or like you said, you're essentially declared heterodox or, or you're a heretic and you were kicked out. Right, right. So then to Germany, to the uh, Socialist Democratic Party um, in Germany. Sorry, let me clarify. This is in Germany in the past tense. This is Christmas in Germany by Jerry Bowler, who is... Bio at the end there. A Canadian historian specializing in the intersection of religion and pop culture. PhD from King's College London, author of Europe in the 16th century, The World Encyclopedia of Christmas, and Santa Claus, a biography. P.S. Santa Claus is not Odin. Stop saying that, people. What? I don't know. I read an article that argued against it, and then I read another article that argues for it. I'm like, of course, of course. My goodness. If you do a if you do a Google search of Christmas in Nazi Germany, there mm-hmm. is article after article after article. This mm-hmm. one's one of yeah. the first one that comes up, but there's actually a Wikipedia entry too, so I'll link to that. Nice. Uh, well, this is from September 7th, 2016, and it's just something I came across, and I thought, oh, this is interesting. We don't really talk about the history part as much as we read theologians, so here's what the Nazis did to Christmas. Context, yes. It's How the Nazis Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Christmas is the most widely celebrated festival in the world, but in few countries is it valued as deeply as in Germany. The country has given the world a number of important elements of the season, including the Christmas tree, as we noted, the advent calendar and wreath. Where did that come from? The wreath? The advent calendar and the wreath. Isn't that Lutherans too? Uh, I'm sure. We'll claim it. Let's just claim it. Gingerbread cookies. I'm definitely probably Lutherans. And box Christmas oratorio. That is for sure Lutheran. Es ist ein Ross entsprungen, or vom Himmel hoch. Christmas became inextricably linked to feelings of national identity. So it is no surprise that the holiday became part of Germany's ideological wars in the turbulent first half of the 20th century. But there is that one ideological problem Mm -hmm. that the holiday is to celebrate the birth of a Jewish Messiah. (laughs) Right. I can't imagine the Nazis had a lot of, uh, you know, 
support mm-hmm. for, especially the uh, the ones with crystal knocked and whatnot. Right. So how how does one get around the the wrinkle that Jesus was a Jew? Well, for the country's large social democratic party. That's interesting. It's Socialist Democratic Party. Christmas was a time to point out bourgeois hypocrisy. Jeepers. When was this written? Oh, that's right. This is about Nazi Germany in the past tense. Uh-huh, right. The sentiments of the middle class with the reality of working class poverty. Man, it's a good thing times have changed. Wasn't that, uh, uh, Chris, what's the Christmas story? The Dickens one. Isn't that a- <laughs> Which one? A Christmas Carol? Yeah, that one. Yeah, that's okay. it. Yeah, that has to do with working class and poverty, doesn't it? Of course it does. Of yeah, it's right at the center of it. Yeah. Hey, did did you celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day a couple weeks ago? Oh no, I saw that. I had Thanksgiving dinner. I we didn't... did we did schedule our our Christmas celebration for our family. Uh, mm-hmm. Can't be on Christmas Day because obviously I have to work. But um, for uh, Kwanzaa on on Kwanzaa, we're going to celebrate Kwanzaa oh, this year. Man, we've we've kind of kicked Kwanzaa to the curb. I don't know. Some some populations seem to have. I don't know remember it i guess i don't know i know it's just it's such a it's such a thing of the past now you know at the time you're like oh kwanzaa i guess it's a thing well just kind of appeared and i I don't even remember like whose idea was this i don't know that was an early 90s thing for it took off in the early 90s ah so they so the german oh my they they set up trees they got the tinsel on it i see a postcard here with uh adolf a little Mm -hmm. girl and they're having some kind of pudding and and it says deutsche weinachten there you go. So it's the <laughs> it's the birth of Germany. Mm-hmm. That's right. Oh my! That's what we're celebrating: the birth of Germany. Who is your savior? Oh, because the state is your god. Oh, this is getting interesting. Yes, I didn't know this. So Christmas is a time to point out bourgeois hypocrisy. If you're a socialist, contrasting pious sentiments of the middle class with the reality of working class poverty. For the Communist Party of Germany, Christmas was the season to attack religion and capitalism. Mm. Party newspapers called Christmas a fantasy that should be abolished, while party militia took to the streets to tear down community Christmas trees, bully churchgoers, or throw tear gas into department stores. Wow. <laughs> that, was a, that was a different time. Yes, different times. Maybe. We'll see. Wow. Wow. <laughs> This left Adolf Hitler's National Socialists supposed as the, as the defenders of this sacred German season. Their brown-shirted goon squads battling it out in public in December brawls with communist Red Front fighters. Don't tear down fascists, the Christmas tree! The fascists and the anti-fascists fighting in front of the Christmas tree. It's a huh. holiday tradition. <laughs> Nazis also used Christmas to promote their anti-Semitic policies, blaming Jewish businesses for rapacious practices, such as spreading COVID. I mean, I'm sorry. Didn't what? No. New York City, what? Uh, what? Vandalizing these shops and urging consumer boycotts. Weird. Hey, Mayor de Blasio, let me send you a link to an article. Wow. Huh. Amazing. Well, I mean, I, I don't blame the Jews. I mean, they don't have to like the holiday, but take advantage of it. I mean, right. <laughs> it's If people are going to buy more stuff, then sell more stuff. I, I don't... <laughs> Isn't it interesting, though, all sarcasm aside and snark, mm. isn't it interesting that it's always the same, it's always the same attacks? It's always the same, it's the same language, it's the same approach. All they really do is just, they don't even really change the, their names. They were literally called the anti-fascists. <laughs> well, I, I, we've said it a couple of times. It, it seems like uh, we just keep trying the same things and thinking that mm-hmm. we're going to do it better the next time. Right. But how do you... Right. Here's my question to history. You're reading about Che Guevara, for example. You're reading the motorcycle diaries. You're reading about the the, the communist revolution in Cuba. Mm-hmm. You're reading all of this. At what part do you just completely skip over where he murders homosexuals and black people and anyone who's not a communist? Well, it's it's not Che that we support. It's Che the idea that we support. Right. That's what I'm saying. Is you have to you have to completely ignore the the part of how he came to power and and how that rested on mass murder right but this happens then, i mean i think do it <laughs> i mean this happens with a lot of the ideological kind of battles right and that you say well we're anti-fascist yeah not like those anti-fascists right exactly and like, well but how are you actually distinct from that right right well we think that everybody must take um a certain vaccine right 
Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, the question, next question is, well, then where does that end? Right. What flu vaccine too? Uh, I mean, it's like either you're going to mandate mandatory vaccines or you're not. I I don't right. know how you can uh, qualitatively pick and choose. Yeah, pick and choose. Yeah. Maybe I mean maybe you can say one's a more severe health crisis than another. Maybe except we've seen I think pretty clearly how even that kind of mm -hmm. information and data can be manipulated for whatever. Well, on the other side, yeah. Okay, well they are only looting and rioting in Minneapolis or oh, Portland right. or Chicago or it's New not widespread. Right, it's not happening here. It's like yeah, yet it's right. not happening here yet. Right. That's how things spread. When you when you drop some when you spill a glass of of juice, and it lands on the tablecloth, mm -hmm. it doesn't immediately soak into the entire tablecloth. Just deal with it tomorrow, spot, right? And it goes and bleeds and permeates the entire thing. Yeah. Hmm. But it, it just it is interesting to me that you, when you read about this, you read about the October Revolution in in, in Russia. You learn you read about Mao's revolution in China. You read about Cuba. It's always the same. It's always the same groups. It's always the same approach. Party newspapers call Christmas a fantasy that should be abolished. Militias mm. take to the streets to tear down Christmas trees and attack churchgoers. Well, this is for I mean, sure happening. I mean, it, I, maybe uh, Carl Jung was onto something when he talked about all the archetypes, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, right. That you have the same kind of um, figures, people mm -hmm. repeating throughout a history. And, and then, of course, they're going to have the same um, right. practices, the same because they have the same motives so they're gonna have this they're gonna do the same sort of things right. the new there might be a nuance like like today we have social media so things happen a little bit differently because of that mm -hmm. right but the i mean it's but still censored what tech is now doing which yeah. is to take over and completely alter the trajectory of quote-unquote social media right well when you're censoring media we're like mm -hmm. well when was the last time that there was widespread censorship of political figures on in the media hmm you know, and you go back yeah. and you look at some of those examples. It's always the same kind of players, and they have the same goals. Yeah, right? it's not just about making a buck or mm -hmm. about protecting the weak and the vulnerable from dangerous ideas or something. That's the lie. That's the lie. Yeah, that lie is used repeatedly too. Well, because it's emotionally appealing. Save me from yeah. my naivete. Okay, right. Hmm. So, in 1933, then Hitler achieved power, and Nazis at first simply tried to co-opt Christmas. Party officials sponsored seasonal celebrations and appeared alongside Mary and Joseph in reenactments of the nativity, singing familiar carols along with their marching song, the Hurst Vessel Lied. I don't know that one. To further identify National Socialism with Christmas in the public mind, the new government undertook a vast program of winter welfare every December. Hmm. <laughs> like food collection and Money. clothing. Yeah. Coats for distributing kids. Distributing money and coats for kids, yes. yes. Okay, I've, I've heard of these things. Yes. Thousands of Nazi youth members and party volunteers collected money in winter Hilfeche, the winter help work, social work. These uh, winter Hilfeche campaigns to be distributed to those families hardest hit by the Great Depression. But at its heart, Nazism was incompatible with the traditional German approach to Christmas. Like the Jacobins of the French Revolution and the Bolsheviks of the Russian Revolution, National Socialists want to reshape the calendar and the annual cycle of celebrations. There would be new holidays, such as Hitler's birthday, new rites of passage for youth and families, and an attempt to alter Christmas by replacing its Christ Christian core with secular and neo-pagan elements. The peaceful sentiments of Christmas had no place in a nation of racial warriors, Thus, the Berlin banners that proclaimed down with a Christ who allows himself to be crucified. Hmm. The German God cannot be a suffering God. He is a God of power and strength. Remember back at the Nuremberg Ooh. trial, the book that we read, right? Right. Mission to Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Remember, that was the problem that Goring had. It was the different Jesus that he believed in. Yeah. Yep. Very much so. Yeah. And that was the Jesus of power and strength, the Aryan Jesus, the Teutonic uh, warrior. All right. So the, the horse vessel lead, I uh, mm -hmm. looked this up. Uh, and they changed it after his death, but tell me how Christmassy this sounds to you. Ready? Raise mm -hmm. the flag, the ranks tightly closed, the essay marches with calm, steady step, comrades shot by the red front and reactionaries march in spirit within our ranks. That's not yeah. sounding very Christmassy. Onward Christian soldiers, but for Nazis. Clear the streets for the brown battalions. Clear the streets for the storm division. Gosh. Millions are looking upon the swastika full of hope. The day of freedom and of bread dawns. Well. 
they know what people want freedom and bread look at there that you go. for the last time the call to arms has sounded oh this is it this is the end for the light <laughs> for the fight we all stand prepared already hitler's banners fly over all the streets the time of bondage will last but a little while now hmm. wow i mean it, if that isn't messianic at yeah. least yeah so it makes sense that may, okay it's not exactly christmas but if you know christ has come and hitler mm -hmm. is our christ our messiah yeah. figure yeah then yeah you could sing this there's one more verse raise the flag oh it's the same as the first yep. comrades shot by the red front and reactionaries march in spirit within our ranks they they later changed it there was less about the essay there was more about stormtroopers yeah which is the essay mm. but whatever a star wars christmas special oh they added more stanzas later too but anyway <laughs> yes star wars christmas with stormtroopers with stormtroopers it is interesting mm. again the jacobins in the french revolution the bolsheviks in the russian and the national socialists in germany same playbook same consequences co-op what religious ideology mm -hmm. and turn the state into god the savior huh mm. and the way Why? to do it like you said is hey do you want to be free then just give us all of your freedom and where god will decide how to best distribute your freedoms to you or are you starving don't worry we'll feed you you know and this is why i've been a little bit um reluctant to jump on the you know it's this is the end kind of narrative that's being spun with the, mm -hmm. this current election. Um, I say current because it's still ongoing, obviously, mm -hmm. right. uh, or maybe not so obvious, depending on when you're listening to this, but uh, well, what you're watching. Yeah, well, that's true, too. Um, is it the end? Possibly. Is it necessarily? Not necessarily. It depends on how, how well you think the Constitution protects against um, malfeasance. And you know how so far, not so well. So far, not so well, although I'm still cautiously hopeful. Um, not so much in the individuals involved but actually mm -hmm. in the constitutional itself protections uh it's but it is a matter of you know lawyers and judges and people actually exactly. you know mm -hmm. standing up for it that my my biggest issue with this situation though is how it's taken on by some um specifically religious even christian um connotations like this mm -hmm. this fight for our nation is a fight for the gospel they use the language of the scriptures that talk about fighting the good fight of faith yeah, right and they co-opt it some people that i actually um i appreciate the work they're doing but i'm like mm -hmm. i i'm not a it, it's not gonna be surprising these are uh, pentecostals largely uh from the south so they i mean they're very much church and state are not even distinct ideas for them yeah. you know that the and we can agree to some extent that the state exists to to protect and preserve the preaching of the gospel mm -hmm. to some extent right yeah to afford for religious freedom but on the other hand it there we don't you know our life does not depend on us defending the state mm -hmm, yeah maybe our physical life but not our spiritual life our spiritual life you know depends on depends on us defending the gospel right and that's where i'm i'm like that's a danger dangerous precedent i think to to think of yeah, for sure to think of the end of a state as apocalyptic it might be you know that's the lord that'll be the lord's decision not ours um but also like um being a, a, a religious a, a fully like religious experience mm -hmm. you know I, we, we i think we've actually kind of maybe not danced with it we've tried to toy with that idea ourselves and say well how much can a christian be involved in the state right well you could be so involved that it ends up becoming your religion right well i was gonna say that's the i think what you see though is indicative of how people have allowed the state to become their god right right that's what i'm getting which is at, yeah. why the language is so apocalyptic Mm. all because or nothing it, this is the end it is really just for them because their god is being threatened well imagine if you're a full-time politician or mm -hmm. a full-time uh, political yeah, reporter pundit. or mm -hmm. a pundit or a lawyer that works in like election law or something mm -hmm. i mean it is your identity is kind of wrapped up in it exactly you know and you, um, you see the entire world through that viewpoint then but we've talked about this in, in really every vocation it's not just political vocations mm -hmm. is that there's a a need to be engaged but yet um abstract from it you know or at least mm -hmm. what's the expression you know that uh when it, in terms of salvation you know there's neither jew nor free slave nor green mm -hmm. uh, slave nor um free mm -hmm. you know i mean there is no distinct that the question is are you baptized that's your identity right. but if you bind your identity up in your vocation right uh what happens when that vocation is torn away from you right right what happens i um, if you consider yourself like i'm an american first right yeah what happens when america falls 
are you going to despair of your very existence? Right. Or are you going to fall back on actually the thing that should have been at the front, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is I'm a Christian. And even if I'm a Christian living in a totalitarian, you know, right. pagan, whatever, right. anti-Christian environment, so what? Well, this is an important point that I was ruminating on over the weekend, reading some stuff too, is that up until very recently, the Christian church was always critical and distrustful of earthly authority. It was a wall, essentially, because the Christian church mm. is always out of step with the governing authorities because it is loyal to Christ alone. And then secondarily to the state, so long as it complies with God's will. So historically, then the Christian church has always been at odds, even under Christendom, the church was at odds then with the ruling authorities, right. because they're saying, mm, sorry, but God's word. It's hmm. only been very recently that we've established this quietism where the church doesn't say anything. It's not critical of the state and it doesn't stand up to authority. In fact, it marches to the beat of the state, especially in the United States since the end of the Second World War. Yeah. So now it sounds really janky to people to hear their pastors all of a sudden preaching about politics and criticizing, specifically if you're doing it right and you're preaching the law lawfully, right. you're critical of the governing authorities and you're calling into question their motives and their intent. And you're saying this is not God's will and they're not complying with God's word. And you're talking about the two kingdoms and people all of a sudden are like, well, wait, no. it's like... Mm -hmm. It's like a fish decides, I'm going to walk on dry land. So it jumps out of the water. It's like, as a Christian, you're supposed to stay in the water. Right. You're baptized. You're a little fish. You can't just decide, I'm going to jump out of the waters of baptism now and walk. No, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. And despite what evolutionary theory says, to the contrary. And you can't be a mud skipper, so don't bring it up. But the point is, is like we've talked about before, you can be a socialist or a Marxist or you can be a Christian, but you can't be both. One is godless, one is obviously obedient to God. Likewise, since the state, to your point, tends to utilize the power given to it to elevate itself to almost divine-like status, mm -hmm. and people are more than willing to give their freedom to that and worship it, fear, love, and trust it more than anything else in the world, if the church does not hold the state to account critically, then the church is going to fall in line and become just another apparatus of the state. Right. And the state ends up being God. I, you know, yeah. I think it is a fair criticism. I've heard this from folks and like saying, well, you only talk about politics every four years or every two years. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a fair criticism. Sure. Right. Um, and that's because the, I think the attacks on the state are less obvious. Or, uh, mm -hmm. sh I should say on the church by the state, those sure. are less obvious in the uh, non-electoral years. Mm -hmm. Um, and but also elections, you know, clearly do have consequences and and fairly significant ones upon both right. legislation and uh, the courts and whatnot. Right. So th so that I mean that's true. That's true. Well, I was also reading this over the weekend though. Monarchies have a vested interest in pacifying the population because they're worried about legacy. Mm. I'm king. I'm going to be king for a while now. I want. Right, but be I've got a son, I and, I... and I've got a son who's going to replace me. So I've got to mollify the the population. I've got to give them bread and circuses. Otherwise, if they revolt, the jig is up. Versus we're on an election cycle. Every four years, a new monarch shows up and says, we need a revolution. It's not, yeah, it's not exactly a monarchy. It's more of... Um, no, I'm just using the metaphor. Though. It's almost it's like, like each election ends up becoming a little revolution. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. And now in this election, one side of the political argument has hyper-politicized every corner of society. Every issue has to be politicized now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can talk about that isn't politicized. You can't even talk about food without it being politicized now. Yeah, you, you saw the link I sent you from the World Economic Forum to tell yeah. you how we're going to eat in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like, not even, it's not even food pyramid, it's worse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's soil and yeah. green. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is not the future I'm planning on, but uh, right. okay. But I mean, they take, Oh, this is really the, the point then is that if everything's politicized, then everything is, you know, this trust relationship, right? Correct. That now we're the authority and we're or really the one in power and we're going to tell you what is and what isn't, yes. uh, which is a responsibility, we would argue, from God alone. Right. You know, and then he were and doing it through his word. Right. Um, and that the state is only being, um, being the state rightfully mm -hmm. when they do what God has given them to do. Correct. Yeah. And so that's the problem with here in Nazi Germany.
<laughs> they yep. get a little, they, they, they have a big appetite. <laughs> big appetite. So with the Nazi takeover of the school system and the National Protestant Church, there you go. Mm -hmm. New hymns and carols replaced fam familiar favorites. Hebrew terms such as Hosanna and Hallelujah were edited out. The first verse of Stille Nacht was now a song of praise to Hitler. Silent night, holy night. All is calm, all is bright. Only the chancellor stays on guard. Germany's future to watch and to ward, guiding our nation aright. Oh my gosh, I've never heard this. There you is go. that why we sing Silent Night? At... Oh my. It kind of is. <laughs> it kind of is, yeah. Only the Chancellor. Yeah, so there's Messiah Chancellor. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. he, he, he's not, not even the vicar of Christ. He is the Christ. This is, I suppose, why it makes me nervous when a secular, you know, whether it's a business or a school or a secular authority, um, starts co opting, you know, um, mm -hmm. distinctly Christological, you know, tunes. Yeah. yeah. And like, how are you singing that? And right. how long will you keep singing that before it kind of strikes you as, yeah, let's just leave out that stanza? Not long. Not long. Not long, because you've already co-opted it. But the right. symbology is powerful. I've talked about this before, is that in Japanese anime, mm. there is Christian symbolism all over anime. And they don't believe a thing about what it symbolizes, but they it's a powerful symbol. Well, it's, it's, in, it's in the same terms of, of Jung, right, with the archetypes. Mm -hmm. Where exactly. they become they become types of this like right. innate reality of humanity. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, was, this was pointed out to me, and it's like, hey, that guy you train with is a Satanist. I'm like, cool. We have a lot in common then. I'm like what? I'm like, I have more in common with a Satanist than I do with you. You're an atheist. Yeah, it's just it's almost the same even text ideology, yes. just inverted. Yeah, we have similar theology actually because it's based on a similar text. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, it's easier for me to talk to a Satanist than an atheist because we have a point of reference. You believe in yes. something? Well, you believe in the Satan of the Bible, usually. That's kind of where the term Satan comes from. So ironically, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to escape the Christian God or at least the Jewish God in some way, shape, or form if you're a Satanist, which is fine. I'm just like, hey, let's talk. <laughs> right? All right. So there were those in the black shirted SS elite who were genuine pagans. They believed in the power of the old Teutonic gods and ancient symbols and relics, which, by the way, is making a comeback today. Is it? A lot of, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. A lot of men's groups and a lot of, um, well, yeah, I guess men's groups in particular have trended toward picking up the symbology and the theology of the old Teutonic Norse well, you, gods. I mean, I'm not to be too critical here, but I mean, you, you have to some degree embraced mm -hmm. your, uh, like Nordic roots a little mm -hmm. bit, yeah. you know, and those figures, whether yeah. it be a uh, Thor or ironically. Whoever. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because it's appealing because in a culture that's completely emasculated men over mm -hmm. the last mm -hmm. century and neutered boys in order to recover masculinity, traditional masculinity, biblical manhood, where do you go? Well, you can't go to the church because the church is emasculated God and men. So right. when you bring up what Joshua, Caleb, David, like men, <laughs> right? The church, you know, people just look at you in the same way they look at you when you talk about politics. Well, it's we've been boring. we've been we've been in judges for our uh, daily prayer and yes. uh, gone through took uh, four days to go through. Um, uh, what's his name? Samson. <laughs> mm, there's a man. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and, is he a biblical <laughs> model of masculinity? Well, in a sense, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, he's a man. He has a thing for uh, Philistine women, obviously, right? three of those and uh <laughs> at least yeah. that we know about yeah yeah exactly the three that are mentioned and but he, i mean he does end up being this horribly broken but mm -hmm. but a wonderful example of of what what christ would give us as masculinity right? right where he destroys the enemy right he unbars the gates he mm -hmm. um because he did that in gaza what was the other thing you know and he, and he ends up destroying the the pagan idolatry mm -hmm. right he brings down the temp their false right. temple upon them right Right. And he dies in the process. Correct. So you look at that and you're like, yeah, I mean, he's a really tragically flawed figure because it's obviously a great he's movie. True man. I don't know. I tried to find a picture to use for the like slide that mm -hmm. starts because I do it as a video. And it's hard to find a picture where Delilah is clothed. Well, um, there's that. Yeah. And, and, and often it's well, see, Delilah. Your, there it is right there. There's that Puritan prudery. Well, I know. We can't so we, show an actual depiction of what the Bible actually describes. We have to water it down and, and make it safe. Right. Well, and even or, quote, a lot of times, kids. Samson himself is not fully clothed. <laughs> so. No. Actually, I just watched a great uh, 
somebody made a, a film of Samson killing the uh, the thousand or whatever. Okay. And I'm like, this is really well made. I like this. This is the good. three thousand in the temple or the yeah three thousand yeah yeah okay no 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 with the um is it with the uh, with jaw, the jawbone the the donkey jaw mm-hmm. the, the jawbone of an ass how many was that what's the number I don't people know was, I, people it was three hundred thousand right something I just it was read a lot it of people last week it was a bunch yeah a bunch I think that it was a bunch Great. so you look at that and you say is that a, a model of masculinity I actually in a lot of ways it is it is actually. Yeah. Right. And to protect it, and defend is actually the classical definition of a man mm-hmm. and to nurture and to raise up is the classical definition of femininity. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, he is a judge. Mm-hmm. Is, is he perfect in that judgment? No, <laughs> no. Right. None of uh, them are. No, no, that's true. And it's the same with the Kings, mm-hmm. you know, and even the, like you, uh, we talked about Josiah before we went on air uh, or you look at David, you know, you're like, yeah, but there's always a, but mm-hmm. there's always a, but. Well, to go back to 1918 and Versailles and the Treaty mm. of Versailles, again, it was the German politicians that surrendered, not the German military. That that treaty, which, you know, peace treaty, was, it was punishment. It was basically the German politicians agreeing to being punished without themselves being affected by that too, you know, too horribly, which is what politicians do. Do what you want to the population, just spare me, you know, let me keep my mansion and my estates. Hitler and all the rest of, of his inner circle were all part of the military. They all fought in the trenches. So they were extremely bitter. They were extremely angry. And then the depression hits and yeah. Germany is decimated. It's like a one-two punch, yeah. So you've literally castrated this country. And you've said to the men of this country, you're not allowed to even own a weapon anymore. You're not even allowed to talk about war and conflict. Yeah, right? you can't defend yourself. No, right. you can't defend yourself, your country, your family, or anything. So they completely emasculated these people in order to punish them for what they did. Hmm. And I'm not arguing the morality of it. I'm just, this is the, the history of it. So, of course, it's going to appeal to a boy in particular in 1930s Germany to see these symbols. Because we've all seen the posters from Nazi Germany. It's the same with the Russians and the communists, the posters, same thing in, in China today with their posters. These strong, virile men and women on these posters that mm. represent the nation. Don't you want to be like this? Don't you want to be a man? Don't you want to be a, a woman? Well, here's how. Follow the chancellor. Right. He'll lead you to the promised land. And he did. <laughs> yeah. He Proof is in the pudding, him. right? It is. So you have these then soldiers who are genuine pagans. They're, they're believers in these Teutonic gods and the symbols and the relics because it's a symbol of strength. And it might be uh, synergistic, right? I mean, there's sure. there's kind of like the, the rabbit's foot, you know, the Christian who has a lucky mm-hmm. rabbit's foot. And you're like, those two yeah. things really don't belong together. But yeah. so it is. We just kind of pick and choose what we like. Oh, for sure. So from these men came efforts to move celebrations from December 25th to the date of the winter solstice to replace St. Nicholas as the seasonal gift bringer with Wotan and to decorate the Christmas tree with pagan ruins, swastikas, or sun wheels. (laughs) Okay. There you go. By the way, there's the confusion of St. Nicholas and and Odin or Wotan. Is which is which? Well, now you know why they're confused. Which came first? Uh, That's a good question. Right. I mean, the same with the I mean, tree. The actual person, St. Nicholas? Well, no, I know he came first, but I, as far as modern day, you know, St. No, Santa Claus, it's this amalgamation, right? I mean, I it's hard. To... It's almost impossible to distinguish the two at this point, except for the fact that, again, if you go back and, and look at the solstice and Wotan worship, we, we kind of edited out some of the juicier aspects of the rituals. Of course, of course. But I mean, it's the same with the decoration of the tree. Mm-hmm. Like, Absolutely. Well, that's not a distinctly Christian practice. It's certainly not right. given in the scriptures. No. Uh, well, it say, is in, in relation to Ashroth poles and the decoration of the Ashroth poles. Okay, yeah, that's, this is, that's not helpful. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very specific too, which is helpful. Uh, yes. As to what it, Think about like Christmas yeah. poles. Why? Sure. Or Christmas lights. Well, we know Christmas lights came from the candles and the candles came from the worship of Wotan. That's where that came from. And the, and the candles came from the burning of the trees. Now, now you could, you know, bring out a scripture text and say that, you know, you can bring all things into captivity to Christ, True, right? Absolutely. And, even, and even... that's what we do every Christmas to justify <laughs> all of the pagan symbology in our churches. Okay. We, I mean, there's, there's literally a laurel wreath wrapped around my baptismal font right now. But wreaths are cool. Exactly. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm like, 
oh, you know what mistletoe is for, right? <laughs> I'm like, in a sense, sure. We're talking about the birth of, yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> like, again, yeah. Is That's it the problem though, is that I know what the symbols mean and the people are like, oh, but it's just pretty and I like mistletoe. I'm right. Like, so, uh, so is it, is it still pagan if you don't know what it means? That's the question, right? Is there power attached to it without, without the words? And right. I, I would say no. Mm -hmm. I would say it's just an icon in search of a meaning, right? But is and that then, biblical or is that more of a 20th century subjectivist viewpoint? Well, it, no, it's a legitimate that, question. But... It's a legitimate question. I mean, is there power in, um, you know, in, in pagan, um, not just icons, mm -hmm. um, but say actions or, you know, right. ceremony or, or tradition. It's like, why did Rachel take her house gods with her? Did she really believe in the power of those gods? Was it despite her father? Was What was it about that fact that she had to take those little she figurines? Was, no, she her? was a historian. She didn't want to forget her past. There we go. That's what it was. It was so she's going to build a museum and put them just in there. Just artifacts. They're just artifacts. That's exactly right. Right. But it is, and by the way, the whole... I'm menstruating and I can't get up right now thing. Like the symbol, again, the symbolism of that, of that interaction is fascinating. It is. Again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it begs the question throughout scripture, especially in the old Testament, we don't really get it too much in the new Testament because we don't get too deeply into the biographies of anybody, but you have to assume that the Roman centurion, for example, worship Caesar. Mm-hmm. Right. Much like Naaman, for example, you know, talks about going back and having to walk with the king into the temple and bow down to Moloch or Dagon, uh, which I, you know, I was actually, I'm like, I was called out in a Bible study because we were reading that. Right. And the person that objected was a visitor and said, well, I, I disagree with this. I'm like, you disagree with my interpretation of the text or you disagree with the text? No, I disagree with the text. You can't do that. That's, that's unionism. That's synergism. I'm like, well, according to scripture, it's not. Well, and according to scripture, that's how people are. Yeah. There, like, there's, there's always like, okay, remember, remember what I told you about like tearing down their false, um, you know, mm -hmm. the, their false altars and, you yeah. know, their astropoles. Um, yeah, you know, they're here again. Got to go right. do it again. Got to go do right. it over and over and over. They bring mm -hmm. in, it, it's like, I think of it like this. Okay. Even if they're faithful, we'll say Christians, mm -hmm. they want to hedge their bets a little bit. So let's just mm -hmm. add some a little bit of that other stuff. Right. Yeah, just in case. What does it hurt? Yeah, what does it hurt? And like hurt? you said, we don't, it, it's just tradition. We don't worship Wotan. It's just tradition. Okay. You know, putting Christmas trees up next to the altar, it's just tradition. We don't actually believe that they are a symbol of, because of course in Christianity, we know what the evergreen tree symbolizes because we Christianized it. And well, the tinsel is symbolized. And the here'd be your symbolized. diagnostic. What if, what if some year you just didn't get around to putting up the trees? Would it right. still be Christmas? Right? That's the question. Yes. And there yes. are those who would say, no, it's not Christmas no, without no, the trees. Not. Just like there's certain hymns you must sing on Christmas Eve. I don't know what you're Christmas. talking about. <laughs> <laughs> just going to put a hedge around that conversation and move on. I don't know what you're talking about. On, on the winter solstice, then SS men could be seen mountaintops on mountaintops lighting fires and performing manly dances with torches. By the way, manly dances is in quotes. While in town, the community were to gather around a massive bonfire from which children would ignite their candles to bring home the light to place on their own Yule tree. What is Yule? Where does that word come from? <laughs> Yule, from the actor, Yule Brenner, King and I. No, I'm not that seven. He's very Yule. popular. Uh, it's akin to Yall? Gaola in December, Germany. It's just a, it's an archaic term for Christmas. That's okay. it. Cool. But it has to do with the time of year. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying Christmas, you say Yule because you got the idea. Yeah. It's gothic. Nice. Yeah. So there you go. There's the bonfires. Dance around the trees. Take your candle. Bring the light home. Yule wreath. Blah, blah, blah. That's where you get the girls walking around with the wreaths on their heads with candles on them. That's your tradition. That's how the Germans didn't it's, do that. That is so freaky. <laughs> like how, how do more young girls not well yeah and then they fire? have the whole thing where they they have to have all the lights because she doesn't have her eyes right mm -hmm. okay yeah that's fun yeah totally normal who are we talking about for our listeners what's her name saint somebody i don't know the day with the it's the day where the when they uh scandinavians do that and they wear the wreath i you can sorry uh it's the hot cross buns day oh. <laughs> all right you know, but that has fantastic. a cross on the top, so those are fantastic. Those, those are, are Christmas too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's Christian. see. 
feast days, feast days. So there, that, there. Where's her name? I don't know. What is it? I can't you remember. Have to, you have to look it up now. We can't. It's not it. Andrew, not Thomas. No, she's not on my calendar, so I don't know who she is. Sorry. Somebody Sorry. write in. Send your comments to Christopher Gillespie. I guess. <laughs> you brought it up and then you just leave us out there. I'm so gonna, I'll the, think of it. I'll think of it. Don't with worry. the beginning of the Second World War, it became even more important for the Nazi state to control Christmas sentiment. To maintain morale during the holiday season, Reich Marshal Hermann Goering supplied shops with plenty of extra food and consumer goods looted from occupied countries. It's St. Lucia, by the way. St. Lucie. Lucia. There December 13th. Nice. Okay. Died in fourth century martyr. Sure so. she did. Mm -hmm. Since the German people had too much emotional investment, you know what? Dying as a Christian in the first four centuries of the church, it was like dying from COVID today. They just, yep, he died from COVID. Fell off a ladder, COVID. Definitely she a died. martyr. She was a martyr. She was definitely, definitely a martyr. martyr. When did Got she a, die? 375? She she was martyred for sure. She had an arrow into her head. Yep. No, that was a Absolutely. martyr. Absolutely. Martyr. Yep. Oh, that would do it though. That's wow. That's okay. <laughs> you don't oh you're not a Twitter user. If you're on Twitter, um, medieval death bot is the best. Nice. Where it takes um death records from the from the mm -hmm. uh 14th century, sometimes 13th century, mm -hmm. and post them each day so you get to find out somebody else died. Somebody died in 1237. Um, you know, <laughs> fell into a well, drowned. Nice. That's fantastic. <laughs> Discovered three days later. <laughs> yeah. Since the German people had too much emotional investment in the holiday for it to be mm. directly attacked, however much National Socialists disliked its emphasis on peace and forgiveness, the Christian content was to be watered down in public celebrations and national publications. There you go. Perfect. In the advent calendar sent out by the Nazi party to families to help with its holiday celebrations, the emphasis was on the solstice. Decorating with decorating with pagan symbols and celebrating military successes. So this is like the Christmas tree, the Rockefeller one, right in New York. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then you dance around the tree and yeah. mm -hmm. or go ice skating or right. Elf on the Shelf. My sister said that people don't like that. I don't know what it's all about, but I never got into it. I see it, but I don't. I don't you know, this seemed like a marketing point. ploy to me. But yeah, of course. To buy these elf dolls. It's weird how all these practices found their way to the united states hmm. it's almost as if at the end of the war we just imported a whole bunch of nazis to the united states and they brought the traditions with them what are you talking about i'm just like hypothetically like if we had oh done okay that, <laughs> and then put them in charge of things over here to run things no no i think <laughs> i think it's more insidious than that um it's that you know faith in christ Mm -hmm. you know, that the world is opposed to that. That's what Jesus right. says, John, yeah, absolutely. John 15, 16, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, that the world is opposed to that. And, and, but that this, this point that he makes that you can't directly attack it because the, the emotional investment in the holiday. Yes. I think that's really, I mean, it's really yeah. intelligent. So, mm -hmm. so what do you do? You have to do like an end run. So, mm -hmm. so you just, you just swamp it out with like all the generic, like yeah. Christmas problem exactly. you hear on like yeah. the radio, right? Yep. Because everybody's excited. The Christmas radio again. And you're like, yeah, but they never sing of Christ. So. And this is a key point, I think, is that, that the reason big tech is failing miserably right now with censorship mm. is they're trying to delete opinions versus don't delete them, simply pile on so many other opinions that the, the original opinion gets washed out. Right. This is the beauty of the term conspiracy theory. If someone just make them look like an idiot, right? Exactly. Just pile on other conspiracy theories that are completely ridiculous, like reptilians. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, conspiracy theorist. So eventually the, the shift is, well, Christmas is about being a German. Christmas Correct. is about uh, celebrating with family. Christmas is about right. freedom. Mm -hmm. What was the other thing in there? You know, Christmas is about the Fuhrer, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, what was the, what was that pithy thing that they had in the 80s, 90s? Oh, Jesus is the reason for the season, right? Yes. Well, right. okay. Yeah. It's a little pithy and, you know, but it's true actually. Right. And I understand, I understand what that criticism was getting at. It's like to say all this other stuff, I guess it's mostly harmless mm -hmm. until it isn't until it actually becomes the reason for right. you. And, uh, well, I mean, just look at it. Like how hard is it to get somebody to come to church on Christmas day? You yeah. might get them on Christmas Eve, but that's just largely out of tradition for many people. I don't right. want to, don't want to impugn motive too much, but you know, so that's just what we do on Christmas Eve and like, yeah. well, like, like this year we changed the service times on Christmas Eve using COVID as excuse. Cause why not? Yeah, because that's what authoritarian, petty authoritarians do, like pastors. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, well, but pastor, we never, 
that's not our tradition. We don't go at seven o'clock. We go at four. Right. We go at eleven or whatever it was. I'm like, well, sorry, you know, right. yeah. This this is what you do is is right. you go and you you hear don't know, whatever it is Luke Luke two, right? You know, uh, that's what that's what we do. Well, we even we even abbreviate that peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Period. Even though that's actually not the end of the phrase. What comes next? Uh, toward those towards whom God has shown His favor. Oh, right. <laughs> it's actually rather exclusive, not uh, inclusive. Yeah, well, so it is. But we keep it inclusive because we want people to come to church on Christmas Eve. <laughs> right, but I'm, I mean, you've heard it, I've heard it. It's like to say, well, Pastor, I'd love to come to church on Christmas, um, you know, but that's that's our family time. Right. Yep. And, and so you can see how that narrative has right. spun out over generations probably right. mm -hmm. of like, here's all this other stuff like, yeah. oh, you know, it's not Christmas until until Franz, you know, Hans Gruber has fallen from Nakatomi Tower. Right, exactly. You know, like, I actually agree with this tradition. I think it's, yeah. I think it's edifying to remember that Die Hard is a Christmas movie, but, um, but that's not actually true. It's kind of a joke, right? <laughs> did you Shut see up. the, did you see the advent calendar? For each day you way. pull out mm -hmm. the date and then Hans Faller's father down the tower. Awesome. It is. <laughs> what a great marketing ploy. It's like, it is, you know, that <sighs> movie to, to take a movie. Nostalgia. Well, to take a movie that well, is arguably actually quite entertaining. Um, mm, I love that movie. And and there's, we watch there's, it every Christmas. There's hardly any flaws in it. I What's mean, that? there's hardly any flaws in it. It's, even. it's pretty much. Yeah. No, I've, I've gotten seriously back into eighties and early nineties action movies in the last couple of months. And they are phenomenally good. Like you don't like, we do not appreciate how good those movies were for as cheesy and schlocky as they were. Mm -hmm. Like go back and watch Die Hard. Go watch Red Dawn. Right. Go watch The Last Action Hero, which was so far ahead of its time. It was. Arnold yeah. Schwarzenegger parodying himself. Yeah, They're fantastic. No, it's good. It was good. It's good. I watched a Netflix. Yeah, you don't have Netflix anymore, but uh, mm -hmm. a Michael Bay movie on there, which was mm. as Michael Bay as Michael Bay gets. Right. Like, like bad with, boys, except with like Netflix money. Oh, okay. So like, just completely outrageous. And mm -hmm. uh, you watch it, and you're like, he's a master of his art. Yeah. He does it's one thing. It's, it's not a great movie. Lane. Yeah. It's not a great movie as far as like dialogue or yep. even just like writing. Um, but what he yeah. does, he does really well. Right. And, and there was a comment uh, that I read on social that said, you know, maybe people need to learn how to enjoy B movies again. No, hundred percent. I think there's I truth to that. Yep. Yeah. That you can, it can be a, it can be a flawed movie and you can still enjoy it. Right. No, absolutely. Go back and watch seventies B movies. Why are we talking go about watch movies? Watch, go watch oh, Shaw Brothers movies. movies. Yeah. Go watch Hammer Film Studio movies. <laughs> those are the best ever. I go back and watch those all the time. Christopher Lee as Dracula and Hammer Films. Mm -hmm. Peter Cushing. Come on. Yeah. Those are phenomenal. Well, I think it's similar to, um, you know, kind of those ones even written for children. I'm thinking of a, what was the, well, I mean, Spielberg did some of these, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, like Goonies. But um, mm -hmm. what was the one with the little critters with the big ears? Gremlins? Yeah, that one. You know? Sam Raimi. And that's Sam Raimi, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where, oh, yeah, uh, well, uh, Evil Dead. I mean, you look, watch, not a great movie as far as like. Oh, I'm sorry, what? As far as like the actual like special effects. It doesn't have to be. Okay. So what's the point? You're judging it based off of uh, uh, modern criteria, right? Right. And budget and that sort of thing. At the time, perfect grindhouse movie. All right. So anyway, traditions that take the place of actual Christmas, like mm -hmm. Hans falling from the tower. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't Singing know. hymns like Silent Night. Oh, right. Okay. That are completely historically inaccurate and not really scriptural. <laughs> <laughs> but they make us feel good about ourselves. And we have the lighting of the candles and the turning on of the lights. It's good stuff. It is. It until It gives us that emotional high. Yeah, until it really takes the place of preaching sacrament mm -hmm. the things that christ actually instituted for right. our blessing. god forbid you actually have the lord's supper on christmas eve well that might get awkward if there's visitors super awkward <laughs> what's this weird thing you're doing what right well it is yeah. called Chris that's mass what Chris, i was gonna say that's what christmas morning is for a pastor that's <laughs> <laughs> okay oh well two days yeah. in a row no i know right and then on sunday because this year it's thursday and friday i think so yeah so it's thursday friday sunday Oof. you get a day off Right in between Christmas morning and low Sunday. <laughs> However, 
As the war dragged on and Germany began to suffer defeats on the battlefield, government agents noted how the population continued to flock to church and how religion was sought for its comfort in the face of mounting casualties. Oh, no. Yeah, I know, right? The Nazi attitude to Christmas now turned macabre. For the 1944 edition of the official advent calendar, the page for Christmas Eve was given over to a chilling, quote, poem of the dead soldiers, wherein readers were told, Einmal im Jahr in der Heiligen Nacht. Verlassen die Toten, Soldaten die Wacht. Oh, it rhymes anyway. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Silent night, holy night. A lot of dead soldiers on the lawn, basically, is what it comes down to. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's rough. All is calm, all is bright. See the blood of the martyrs on the field of battle. Yeah, good times, good times. So again, what we talked about this yesterday in our Bible study on Zephaniah. All gods are death gods, mm. other than the true God, because all of these gods are gods that we are coming out of the law. And they demand sacrifice because the law is relentless and the law demands perfection. Do this or else you die. So the law never says do your best. The law says do better. Your good is never good enough. Right. That's the nature of the law. Right. The law diminishing returns then because of our humanity, our finitude. So then we we make these gods out of our need to escape the demands of the law. But our gods then, because they're law, are always demanding more from us, which is the language of sacrifice. So what do you do then on those days that you just you can't give anything anymore? You mm. just got nothing left. Right. But the law is there saying, no, you've, what do you got today? Yeah. I did my best. I, I got nothing left to give. I don't care. It's, yeah. it's like taking a, a loan out from the mob. They don't care that you can't pay it back. It's collection day. Well, you have to find somebody else then to throw at the problem right. to say, well, I can't do anything today because I'm burned out. But what about my wife or my husband or my children or my coworker? Take them instead. And that's the nature of human sacrifice. So of course, these the Nazis, as we go, are going to replace the living God with the death cult the, and the dead God, the God of the law. So of course, then the hymnody is going to take on the tint of that theology, which macabre, is like ultimate, yeah, yeah, which is becoming macabre because we don't have life to give to you. We have no life left to give, and the proof is the fact that most of our men are dead on a battlefield. Hmm. So what? rather than sing about Jesus, the life of the world, we will sing about the dead soldiers in the fields. Well, and that's why I mentioned traditions because um, they don't have life in them. Correct. Uh, and and so, you know, the fact that Germany would take all these dead traditions and these dead mm -hmm. gods, well, they're only as dead as you let them be. Exactly. Right. That's the problem. Go with, watch uh, American gods. That's what I was thinking of with yeah. idolatry, right? Is that, mm -hmm. you, I mean, you can convey life to them just by giving them authority. Right. Um, it's, in a sense, you can raise an idol from the dead. <laughs> no, 100%. Mm. We do it all the time. Yeah. Like, like socialism. <laughs> Thought we put that to bed. Right. Nope. Nope. But I reflect on this more and more now because of the power that symbol has had on the population. Mm. And, and in my opinion, the extremely negative and destructive turn that it's taken, which is that people do not appreciate, or maybe they just refuse to acknowledge how much power they have to empower an idea and make it a living reality. Right. In the sense of, like, I'm sure where you're at, the police, <laughs> law enforcement in my, in my area, like, we are not going to go door to door counting heads at Thanksgiving time. We refuse to enforce this mandate. It's not our job. It's not law. I'll tell you though, I, I thought about, you know, my more, um, I would say hostile neighbors, um, mm -hmm. you know, to uh, hostile to those who, uh, you know, aren't really on board with the mask mandates yeah. and those kind of things. Uh, and that, you know, we had family over. So there were a bunch of vehicles in front yeah. of our house. And I'm like, you know, I don't want the the dirty looks, but mm -hmm. like, what am I supposed to do? Right. You know? Right. But it's but I would dirty looks. What I'm saying is, what when when law it enforcement isn't anymore? Yeah. Again, the the only threat that any law has is the threat of force enforcement, literally law enforcement. When law enforcement says about a mandate, this is not constitutional or legal or lawful, therefore we're not going to enforce it. You strip the the political leader of their authority because well, their, their authority power. comes through it's law not... enforcement. It strips their power and therefore right. their authority. 
But then what you have to come to, what you have to grasp is the only entity that is enforcing this mandate are your neighbors. Mm -hmm. They are well, literally manifesting this ideology in their own life. They become a representation of now something rather than an actual person. Well, in our case, the, um, I know we've covered this on the show, but um, my governor um, had his authority mm -hmm. not taken away from him. He, he, over, he overextended his authority, right? And then yeah. the court said, um, no, you, you don't have authority you know, to maintain a perpetual uh, mandates. You, you could do 60 days mm -hmm. and then you have to go to the legislature, all right? That's what right. the law is, which is good. Um, so what did he revert to? I think this is really important. There's other tools of power and manipulation, and he reverted to shame. Right, right. So you, you, uh, Wisconsin people, you should be ashamed at mm -hmm. your behavior because look, um, you know, artificial caseload increase, yeah, death laundering to show increases. I mean, all sorts yeah. of strategies that they use uh, at the health department to to show um, as the situation is being abnormal when in reality it's not all that abnormal. Right. Uh, but then, but then it's always, uh, yes, you should be ashamed, and you, and they teach your neighbors then to make you ashamed at your behavior. <laughs> Right, like I was mentioning with the Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. it's like the fact that I even thought about like what my neighbors would think um, shows that that conditioning has been ongoing. It's been happening, correct? And yep. and that um, that I'm even at all concerned about what my neighbors would think about us having right. a family celebration on Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. you know, with three households. I'm right. Um, now you say, well, are you you were being reckless? No, we all knew the risk, mm -hmm. and we have some high risk individuals involved, and we mm -hmm. chose we chose to um, to take a risk, right? You know, and you could say right or wrong, but we looked at the data, we looked at what we what we knew, and as a family, right. we agreed that this was more important, right. you know, than being isolated on Thanksgiving. So, mm -hmm. um, what does our neighbor think? Well, actually, in the end, it doesn't really matter. But I think that that public shaming thing is going to become even more increased. Oh yeah, absolutely. And because that yeah. that's ultimately going to be actually even probably a more effective strategy than than governmental. Mandate. I think so because we were talking before we hit record, like in Minnesota here. Um, which is a different personality type than Wisconsin, but like my family's just been vilified. Yeah. For you can't years. go anywhere, right? Not really. Because if you do, it's like, no, you have to now. We refuse to even allow you to come near the store if you don't mask up. Mm -hmm. Period. And therefore, you now all of a sudden become identified as anti maskers. I think I mentioned it um, maybe a couple of months ago, but yeah, I mean, well, I know you've had this experience. I mean, getting yelled at outside in a parking lot, right? Like twelve feet away from somebody. You're like, mm -hmm. that's n that's not normal. That's not scientifically based. Mm -hmm. It's not even the law or even a mandate or a recommendation Correct. by anybody. Right. This is not a cause for concern. Mm -hmm. And yet, to have a neighbor, quote unquote, yell at you mm -hmm. from across a parking lot outside, yeah, um, it's pretty yeah. incredible. Honestly, at this point, you might as well just yell the N word at me. Or call me a Jew. It's the same attitude. Or death threat or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's what you I mean, this is effectively again, this is what kids were doing. I, I got this book I'm reading right now. It's written for middle schoolers about um, two, who, two who survived, about two Jews, Hungarian. All right. Yeah. We've, we've yeah. referred to that on the show. Yeah. You know, I'll she went to school up. with Christians her whole life. They had never had a problem. And then all of a sudden, within six months, they were screaming dirty Jew at her on the street and throwing rocks at her and her, her siblings. It's like, you've known me my whole life. Right. I'm the same person I was six months ago, but now all of a sudden I'm a dirty Jew because the radio told you that I'm a dirty Jew. And here's the reasons why. And well, it's like, I, you know, it's amazing and yet not surprising when you study history to recognize how quickly these things happen. But I think something we can learn from this lesson, I don't know if it's always the case. I think it is eventually, but, but it certainly is in Nazi Germany is that they keep pushing that rhetoric harder and harder mm -hmm. and it finally does break um you know the human spirit can only tolerate so much of this kind of you well, know yeah, oppressive tens of millions of people died well there's that i mean how <laughs> long would the honest. germans have gone gone on with it without foreign intervention i guess that's the that's a question we can't really answer mm -hmm. although uh there isn't a fictional attempt to do so um uh man, man in, in the, the high castle man in the high castle yeah well, the um, Russians got away with it for a couple of decades. And the Chinese decades in front of seventy all of years, us. something like that. Yeah, I mean the Soviets murdered hundreds of millions of people. Yeah, you yeah. Know, so and the Chinese so you, government's doing it right now in front of us all, and we don't care. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we care, but the the question is, what can we do? 
do Probably we want to if we wanted to well we're capable certainly right. i'm just saying we're the most powerful military on earth ever. oh the, they have they have more manpower though doesn't matter we have the technology you, you think so yeah absolutely we got lasers in space now that too i'm just saying if we wanted to we could right so what it was it that it was it was foreign intervention that finally undermined this but i but i think yeah. the but it, but i do i do like the point that the uh, jerry here is making mm -hmm. which is to say they eventually ruined christmas they literally took mm -hmm. anything there was nothing left of optimism in it well but we have to take a step back because remember that most of the pastors in most of the churches in germany were preaching the party line this is save, their, save their neck or whatever yeah right is that mo you had to be a brown shirt you had to be a card carrying brown shirt essentially to be a pastor in a lutheran church in germany mm. under the nazi or uh, democratic socialist um party they were preaching the party line throughout and up and through 45 because we know for a fact that when sazi went back to teaching classes they turned their backs to him after the war because he was a traitor yeah so i don't maybe to a certain extent that's true but even when my doctor father was in germany in the 70s there were still people in germany in the 70s complaining about the way that they were treated in 45 they were still mad <laughs> yeah. about things so i wonder how complicit the ordinary layperson is in germany because we know from like kierkegaard for example and the lutheran church in in denmark in his day people just went along with it it was right. a state church and it was completely corrupt and didn't preach the gospel and produced some of the most famous atheists of of the of the day sure but if you look at what kierkegaard has to say about people he's the crank he's the sarcastic snarky one he's the one that's got the problem and everyone's just looking at him saying what's what's your problem no, and just I just, I, other than the free churches graduate, in Germany, because right. we knew there were free churches, but those pastors were either hung or put in jail. Mm -hmm. Right. The, I would say nine out of 10 churches in Germany, maybe even 95% of churches in Germany, everybody was completely fine with it. In fact, like I said, I took care of a woman who was in the Hitler Youth and she went to church. They, had, they, they didn't know any different though. Yeah. Because they were born in the 30s under the Nazi regime. So they grew up in church. Sunday school confirmation, all of it was just Nazi propaganda, but for them, it was Orthodox Christianity. Well, and I, we've, I know we've been critical a bit about this. I don't know in what context you and I have been critical. I don't know if we've done it on this show, um, as to the role of nationalism in our churches mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, sure. You know, we talked about it, I think in the last couple episodes about how many of our own, uh, churches, pastors would be considered Republican Yeah. You know, and, you know, of a really you know, our registered Republican, I was like, I, I don't know if it's 95%, but that, that seems a little high. I think I know quite a few independent minded people. Uh, sure. I don't know. And I don't know many well, Democrats. In the last 10 or 20 years, you have more libertarians, but yeah, I think so. Um, it's still predominantly Republican in our church body. Right. And it's over moral social issues. That's the fruit of the eighties mm -hmm. and the, the moral revolution yeah. there and, um, or the, mm -hmm. the, uh, religious right and whatnot. Right. But uh, in the end, it's like, well, what, still, I, I ask the question, why do we have a flag in church? Why right. do we have a national flag in church? And like, well, the you know, this is God's country. Is it? Because England says that they're the new Jerusalem. Right. We, we both can't be, you know, the <laughs> promised land. Right. It's, like, you gotta, it's like the football player at the end of the game, you know, thanking Jesus for giving his team the victory. It's like, well, wait a minute. What about the other team? <laughs> they're God forsaken. I guess. They're God forsaken. That's why they lost. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that yeah. <clears throat> so, so I mean, it does beg the question: is to say, you know, how much nationalism is appropriate? And I would argue, mm -hmm. you know, citizenry. We can talk citizenry. Then you make the most of what you've got. Right. Well, nationalism is just a, a perverted form of tribalism. Mm -hmm. That's the right. problem with it. And it has with it like <clears throat> it's, like it's, it's an abstract. It's an abstract entity because it's too large to mm -hmm. be. You can't fit an actual tribal identity in a nation state. But what they do very effectively then is they capture the, the verbiage and the symbology of tribalism and clan, and then project it onto that big screen and go, you are this. Right. And religious ideology, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You've got symbols, yeah. you've got, mm -hmm. you got flags, salutes, um, hymns. Mm -hmm. What else? 
uh, mandatory holidays. service, yeah, holidays, holidays. yeah, holidays for martyrs. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And are those things inherently idolatrous, religious idolatrous? It's a hard. I mean, it's a hard question because we look at them and like, well, we want to recognize the dead, but can right. we do that outside of faith in Christ? Mm, no, you know, faithfully, or, no, I mean, no, because the old Adam is going to be everything. The old Adam does is idolatrous. I'll tell you one of the most impressive things I've ever seen is the uh, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, right, in Arlington? Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. It's impressive, but it's also impressively pagan. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I, I, have the, I have the exact same sentiment. I was like, this is amazing. Wait a minute. <laughs> right. This is amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's hard. And like, like we talked about, I mean, even people that I, I want to support you know, who I mm -hmm. think are doing good work as far as protecting uh, our union as a nation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, like, could you just cut out co-opting all the religious uh, language right. and then right. and bringing that in? Because right. that, that precedent, mm -hmm. you know, this is not, I mean, it's not inherently a religious battle. It is in a sense that it's your mm -hmm. vocation as a citizen or, or as a politician <clears throat> or as a military person or, or whatever right. it is, or as a reporter or a journalist. But that's it. That's as far I, as it goes. I wonder... I wonder how much is a, is a lack of familiarity too with moral philosophy. Mm, maybe. And just a familiarity overall with philosophy. They're not students of philosophy. They don't have that classical education. Maybe. Right. right. <clears throat> and therefore, what do you fill that void with? How, what, what language do you use? We need, you <clears throat> need some kidding. language. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And especially if you're from the South in the Bible belt. It's going to be King James. <clears throat> it's got to be because you've got to get reelected. So you're gonna you're gonna use all that old English because mm -hmm. it sounds old time religion, old time religion, yeah, mm -hmm. right. Well, well, and in a sense, <clears throat> I, I mentioned this to my kids on the way home from church, and uh, we're talking about how the First Amendment is the uh, well, freedom of speech is the protection of all liberty mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. our country, right? If you can't speak, then you can't defend your liberty, right? Right. I mean, also if they take your guns, but first <laughs> speak, right? Um. But then I, I told them, I said, look, the, the Declaration of Independence, the, the Constitution, the amendments, First Amendment and the rest, mm -hmm. these are our religious texts as a country. Right. Right. And that's why people want to defend. But that's also why they why they adhere to them, because we, we've it's not just a common agreement, but it, but it, it's a, it's almost a religious um, necessity, mm -hmm. because if you no longer live according to the Constitution in this country, you're no longer part of the tribe, you're no longer part of the country. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, and th that idea of it being a religious, religious, I mean, religious in the, in the most secular sense. <laughs> cultic. Yeah. Cultic. That'd be a better word. Mm -hmm. Not religious as, as far as like faith in God, but people do have faith in, in their country. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we're seeing now with the controversy, which we've talked about, uh, we've seen it with the media, we've seen it with COVID, we've seen it with many venues, but also now with politics is that uh, the faith is shattered. Yeah. Like you, I mean, you mm -hmm. and I, we've not really trusted the government. I think for most of our adult life, if yeah, not longer, exactly. yeah, <laughs> we were enculturated um, by, you know, punk music and whatever, you know, yeah. but don't trust the man. That's uh, that's even going farther back. So I'm um, trusting leaders and trusting rulers mm -hmm. and trusting politician, uh, uh, judges, magistrates, laws, even I'm like, no, these things are all flawed. They're all flawed. They're not perfect. Mm -hmm. And they do fall short and we fall short of keeping them or refor right. reforming them as needed. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a different, I mean, it's just a difficult position to be in because we're- Because the church no longer looks at secular authority with a skeptical eye. Right, it exactly. No, it no longer just points at authority and says, you're not complying with God's will, therefore, no. Right, because it's because <clears throat> of that God and country. Exactly. Where they yeah. where they have equal, equal authority, equal value, but also right. equal honor and fear. Which from a secular perspective is a necessary move because you've got to win oops, you've got to win those people to your side. And so the only way you're going to quiet them down and pacify them is to bring them over to your side by using their language and adopting their symbology. You have to go to church on Sundays. You have to be seen in church. Even if you can't pronounce Psalms, you still have to pretend you're about Catholic. <laughs> because guess what? No one cares. Well, but we have to maintain the facade. It's tradition. I mean, I get you read the prompter wrong, but on the other hand, it's like if you've been to church, you'd know better, right? There's, there's, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> there's no way you, you didn't know how to pronounce that word. Yeah. There's no way. 
Unless. But you can't get elected unless you are. Right. Well, that's right. not true. Unless you've read two Corinthians. How do you, how do you supposed to? Well, that's true. Or, or you you live in Vermont. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Which is very pagan. Right. But the point is then, because of the confusion and the mixing of the two kingdoms, like in Nazi Germany, the state, like you said, it's not like the state becomes more and more Christian. That never mm. happens. Mm -mm. No. It's that Christianity becomes more and more like the state. Pagan, until finally secular. the state is yeah. the religion. It becomes God. And then mm. you can't question the state because then you're questioning God. And that's a complete misreading of Romans 13, by the way. We yeah, I that. agree. Yeah, we, we talked <laughs> about that at length already. It's an absolute misreading of Romans 13, which again was an interpretation that was peddled by secular authorities to pacify the church. I think so, based on my reading. And, it, and yeah. like we said, that was in the Zasa episodes, mm -hmm. 182, 183, uh, in the 30s yeah. in particular. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, you got to, you got to go with us because we're the, or we have, you have to go with your leaders right. because God put them in place and right. like, okay. Um, but when can you, when can you be a dissident? No, mm -hmm. you can't be a dissident. Nope. Mm, how does that make, then how can you be a Christian? Correct. Because, you know, Paul, I mean, he spoke against civil rulers. Yeah. I mean, he was kind of gentle about it. John the Baptist did. That didn't go well for him. He lost his head, but yeah, right. you know, Jesus did, got yep. him killed. Yep. So, I mean, Pontius Pilate didn't do it. He just washed his hands like a good, right. a good judge would. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, he let the people kill Jesus. You guys take care of it. <laughs> right. <clears throat> kind of like you said, a shame-based culture. Yeah, no, very much so. Very much so. So don't so let them ruin Christmas, right? Is that's that the right. point? The, the secret to not letting secular politicians cancel Christmas is to simply ignore them and celebrate Christmas. Do your thing. That's right. Because Jesus is risen period. Hmm. <laughs> so every, every generation is confronted by this in some way, shape or form. We have enjoyed a bubble of luxury in this country for about five generations now. No doubt. That bubble has popped. <laughs> and that is no longer 80s hyperbole that there's a war against Christmas. That's just a fact that Christians are being attacked going into churches. That's a fact. Well, churches the previous wars burned. against Christmas were not even wars. I mean, they're almost like a distraction from the real war. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a great way to say it is. Oh, we can't, you, with, you can't have a nativity scene in the, in the courtyard in the, the right. like in front of the courthouse. Like, yeah. Was that really what you were upset about? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So this year, cause I know as of December 14th, I can predict the future cause it's on the state website. Um, as of December 14th, the churches will be allowed to operate. However, if you scroll down, there's only a maximum of 25 people allowed indoors for any activity. Although the Supreme Court just said you can't act that way. I know. Oh, I know. But my governor is a socialist and doesn't actually care about the Constitution. So well, you're not going to you're not going to take him to court. We did. <laughs> yeah. Are continuing to do so. Well, right. The well, courts are. if I've learned anything about the courts, you can't take somebody to court until you until you can show damages. So. Yep. Yep. So when they come after you and they fine you or they, they sue you, then now you can take them to court. <laughs> yep, exactly. And you say, okay. So yeah, that's where that's going. And uh, yeah, just open up, celebrate Christmas, celebrate. The, the Supreme Court precedent, I should be clear on this since I brought mm -hmm. it up, um, is that um, equal, equal protection slash equal abuse, I guess we might say. Yeah. So, yeah. so whatever rule applies to the liquor store applies to the church. Correct. And vice versa. You can't yeah. have, you know, you can't say you can only have 10 people in a church that can seat a thousand, you know, that's right. not, res that's not being responsible. No. no. Or in your case, you know, you can only have 25 people in a church that seats what, 200 or something, 150. My church, 140. 140. Tops. Yeah. Yeah. Unless that's also the rule that's being applied to every other. Uh, Correct. Similar social right. setting. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So recognize, be wise as, what is that? Wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. Mm -hmm. Be bold as lions. The Lord loves lions. He does. He does. So that's what we got. And that's where we're at. And there are, yeah, you see all these churches complying. Well, and I would say one other thing too, though, you know, if you're going to fight for Christmas, fight for mm -hmm. the, fight for the actual, you know, institution yeah. of Christmas, you know, yes. which is the hearing of God's word, receiving, Correct. receiving of the supper, 
Right. I, That's a good you, clarification. Yeah. You know, if if you if that means you don't put Christmas tree lights on your church or Christmas lights on your church because you don't want to draw attention to it, that's like who cares, right? Right. It's aesthetics. If you, I, I appreciate what those. Uh, I think we mentioned in the last show that what the Jews did when they had that wedding, you mm -hmm. know, and didn't tell anybody about it, didn't make a big yeah. stink out of it. There were yep. seven thousand men yeah. and, plus women and children yep. there, and they got in trouble afterwards. Um, or although exonerated now by the court, but still, mm -hmm. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't have to make a big stink out of it. You know, right. just do your thing and right. uh, don't let them just keep, let them keep them out of your Christmas. That's right. it. And like, actually, he pointed out in the article, um, what I've discovered, and I think you have too, is people will find you. The Holy Spirit will lead people to you regardless of how well lit your church is. That's been my experience. You know, we, I found out a couple of years ago that in the community, in the area, people just assumed our church had closed. Like, oh, St. John's and Webster? Yeah, I think that closed. That was just the general attitude of people in our mm -hmm. community. And yet, here we are. <laughs> people right. have found us throughout COVID. Yeah, And course. continue to do so. And they will continue to do so. Like you pointed out, though, because the emphasis is on the gospel and the gifts, not on the optics. Well, and ultimately, that's... <clears throat> um, well, those are the only means that the Holy Spirit uses. Correct. To bring people into the church. Right. So, you know, cow, you know, uh, whatever, bending over backwards um, to capitulate to what the state says Christmas should be like. Mm -hmm. Right. Isn't going to win anybody over. Right. Which, in many cases, the state is godless. Well, they're always, no, they're not godless. They are God. Well, I should say the, polit the politicians are godless and or trying to set themselves up as gods. Yes. Yeah. Especially when they try to say, here's what, here's what Christian worship looks like. And you're like, yes, hmm, I don't think you've yes. been to church. <laughs> yeah. You can have church. You just can't sing or chant or pray. And there can only be 25 of you. Yeah. And you can't like be near each other. Yeah. Can't celebrate the Lord's Supper, for example. Right. Can't pass cooties around. <laughs> to which you as a Christian say, see you Sunday. Yeah, I'll be in right. church. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Come what may. Yeah, that's what I tell my people. You know, is hey, we're open. Doors are open. You can come. It'll be the same as always, just a little bit brighter. A couple more banners up this time of year, but otherwise, mm -hmm. it's Christmas. So what's well, actually Advent, but we're looking forward to Christmas. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not as Nazi about that anymore. <laughs> not to co-opt a phrase. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you I had who, to do you it. You know who did that? Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like Advent. I like Advent. It's just I like, actually, yeah, I, no, I prefer Advent to Christmas, actually. No, uh, I also, it, prefer, I also pre, pre, um, prefer Lent to Easter. So. No, you don't. I do. I prefer Lent to Easter now, for sure. This, to the season, okay. Yeah, but I think it's this. I think it's for this reason, isn't it? It's maybe mm -hmm. a nice, nice tidy bow for this this yeah. gift here, right? Is to say, <sighs> bad pun day. All right. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> that uh, the state hasn't co-opted Advent. Correct. And so it's not that it's pure, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have as many distractions. Correct. You know, that have been kind of put in to just, well, to distract us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the decorations yeah. aren't it's, really it's the same. It's ignored by and large by the community and therefore it's not watered down and washed out with all kinds of added stuff it, to it. It can just be that weird thing that Christians do. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Nice. So be weird. Christians. Be weird. Be weird in Christ. It's cool. I agree. Good. Well, thanks for listening. And uh, we'll be back next time for something else. Non-specific. <laughs> Non-predictive. Before non we hit record. You can keep sending us recommendations and we might consider them. Absolutely. We, we do keep them. We have a list. Mm -hmm. we, we, actually, we actually keep a file with all of the suggestions. We are just random abstracts. And so we start off with the best of intentions and then just go downhill. Yes. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Peace.